Thank you, everyone. We're, we're back. That 10 minutes went really fast. Um, and I appreciate those of you that come up during the break and talk to me. That's, that's always, you know, if you have some suggestions that you want to talk to us about, that's not necessarily with the microphones on and in front of everybody. You can go ahead and, you know, approach myself or Stephanie or Bernard, um, and then we can incorporate that into the discussion. We're, we're really happy to do that. When we, when we broke off, uh, uh, you know, we were talking, or I was mentioning about the idea of, of um, y we had talked about the, the possibility of a test drive of the technology in order for the department to be satisfied that it's safe. Um, and, and that's kind of branching into that, that subject. To do, um, is is self-certification just sufficient, or is there something that is more that we can rely on and trying to either come up with a, with a, with a system where we make ourselves comfortable that self-certification is, is sufficient or ourselves comfortable that something more should be done. And, and again, you know, part of our concern is that as the technology gets introduced out on the street, we've done exact um, everything that we possibly could do to make sure that those assurances that have been given to us are valid assurances and that with the, with, the, um, with the resources that we have available to us as a department, that we've done our, our due diligence to the maximum extent possible to make sure that when we give you an application or we give a manufacturer an application, everything that's been done is possible to make sure that, that the vehicle that's being introduced onto the streets is safe to do so. So with that, I'm going to open back up. I know that during the break, um, some people approached and had some suggestions that they wanted to make or some, some additional comments that, we that they wanted to make. So I'm going to go ahead and go on and let Bernard. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, Barb, you um, had a potential suggestion for how we can move forward with the regulations. So we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, Barbara Wendling with Volkswagen Group of America. Uh, it did, does occur to me that we've been talking about functional safety on the one hand and about a sort of uh, modified driving driver's test for an automated driving system at the end of the process and that it might make sense to consider some sort of a two-tier regulation. On the, on the one hand, you have automakers, established automakers with a long regulatory compliance history and notwithstanding some recent issues with defects, which really have nothing to do with regulations, um, you know, we have a long history of developing safe products for, for customers that everybody in this room relies on. Um, and so you might have a two-tier regulation where established automakers who are designing and building an automated driving system for their own vehicles or who are working with another company uh, under a business arrangement for sharing confidential information to apply an ADS to their own vehicles, apply it to more of a self-certification regime and do the testing at the end, sort of like a driver's testing versus an aftermarket company that's developing an ADS and applying it to another manufacturer's vehicle where they have no relationship with that vehicle manufacturer and you might be more concerned that the vehicle could be inadvertently taken out of compliance or otherwise not be adhering to a good functional safety process. And that for the aftermarket situation, you have, <coughs> excuse me, perhaps more of a third party um, certification process. Any comments on that? Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, is this on? I guess this is on. You're on. Great, and I'm on. Uh, I'm Jonathan Handel. I'm an entertainment technology attorney and former computer scientist, and I don't represent anyone with an interest in this. I'm here, in fact, in part because of having heard a comment that uh, the Volkswagen representative made at an earlier workshop where she said that she was sure that none of the companies involved would uh, put unsafe products on the road. And that uh, came at the same time as the GM ignition problem was in the news. And I, I think it's kind of astonishing to be asked to accept self-certification from manufacturers who have shown repeatedly uh, that they can't be trusted, unfortunately. Uh, we, we know about cover-ups. We know about defects. Uh, we know in the case of Google about uh, privacy issues and consent decrees and settlements of alleged violations of consent decrees, uh, it simply is not reasonable and it is not in the public interest to accept self-certification. Self-certification is a necessary but far from sufficient uh, uh, condition. The only solution, if given that DMV does not have internal resources and expertise in this area, is third party. And not just third party uh, driving tests, 
whether they're one week of driving tests or six months of driving tests, but also examination of the source code. The FDA, in uh, some of its dialogue concerning uh, medical embedded medical device software, talks about safety issues and, and says, as any computer scientist knows, that you can't test software simply by trying to run various inputs through it because there are an infinity of cases, and that's particularly true of embedded software and of artificial intelligence software. And of course, a robotic car is both of those things. It's an AI system, and it's a real-time, real-world system. So you could say, I'm gonna test 100 cases over six months, and I could say, okay, but what about if in addition to those cases, there's someone turning left in front of the car at exactly the time that it's making its maneuver? Well, now I've just doubled the number of cases to 200. And what if a rerouting instruction is coming through at exactly the same time? Well, now it's 400. What if the car has been driving? You know, you know that sometimes problems with your cell phone or your computer can be solved by rebooting because you're clearing memory. So what if the car has been driving for five hours rather than just two hours and there are memory overflow problems, things of that sort? One thing that is absolutely necessary is code analysis, static code analysis, among other things, of the computer source code that, Im that these systems are implemented in to look for things like memory overflow and uh, stack overflow problems, memory corruption, all sorts of technical errors uh, that can occur in software that you cannot test simply by saying, well, I've got a 20-minute driving test or I've got 100 driving tests and six months worth. Now, w one last point. Okay. With, with, with respect to the issue of, well, it's gonna add six months to the development cycle, the third parties need to be embedded in the process of the development of these systems as they're being developed so that it isn't constantly chasing your tail to try to catch up with what's the last version. And when it comes to updates of software, the FDA says that an overwhelming percentage of bugs that they find actually occur in updates rather than original releases of software. Just, just a, a couple of points. Um, when you talked about the the, st the static code analysis and it being part of the uh, the testing, but isn't that what the manufacturers are doing right now? Isn't you know once they got when they came to us and 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 applied for um, a permit to test, they'd been developing the cars for several years. I don't know how many, but isn't that something that they've been doing all along? And so by the time that they get to us with that application that says we're ready to introduce the vehicles and let the general public have them outside of your testing regime, they've already done that. And so, so isn't what the issue is at that point in time is being to verify what they've already done? Well, it's to have a third party, an independent third party, actually do it as well. We don't know exactly what tools any given manufacturer is using. And there are, there are no regulations out there that say uh, what the best practices should be, or that even say the manufacturer has to use these kinds of these kinds of tools. Um, Are we already too late for that? Because the reason why I say that is that the the vehicles have been in development and the systems have been in development for probably some time now. Right. And so if we if we tried to have a regime that says that the third party has to be embedded throughout that entire development period aren't we already coming in at the 11th hour? Because haven't they already been developing for quite a while now? And, and now we would say, well, we want someone embedded in your, in, the, in your team, and that would be the person that we were relying on. But we're coming in later after you've probably done 80 to 90% of the development of the technology. Well, two separate issues. The issue of static code analysis is not an issue of whether or not someone's embedded. So it's, we're certainly not too late for that. Um, the issue is having Google or the manufacturer provide the source code under tight confidentiality to a third party, probably on site at Google to increase their comfort, but uh, you know, doing that testing. In terms of the embedded issue, um, we're only at the 11th hour if in fact these cars are gonna be on the road for consumer use, for public use, uh, you know, the day after tomorrow. Um, we're still probably a couple years off at a minimum uh, from that, and so I think rather than saying we're at the 11th hour, let's say, uh, you know, let's get it done now rather than have it not happen. Jonathan, yeah. that, that model that you are, are describing where a, a third party would do code review of a manufacturer or a, 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 a company before their product rolls out to market, does that model exist in any other industry? 
I believe that part of the way um, avionics works with de designated engineering representatives uh, includes, uh, can include code review, and in fact includes more rigorous kinds of code review than I'm proposing here. Things like traceability and just, uh, you know, enormous levels of justification for each line of code in the uh, software. But DERs are either uh, employees of the company in some cases, but uh, they are uh, sort of sworn under oath to the FAA to represent FAA interests, or in the case of companies that don't have their own DERs, there are independent third-party DERs. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, this is Chen Yao Chen with the uh, California Press Program of uh, UC Berkeley. So, um, Brian, I'm, I'm trying to approach this from a layman's point of view. Uh, in today's world, California and all the other states give someone a driver license, young or old, after a written test and 20 minutes of driving on the road. And we all know that every dri licensed driver driving out there carry a certain level of risk and safety hazard. But we still let the system go on. And we just let the social and legal system deal with the potential problem. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking from, I'm, I, we all know that DMV has been put into a challenging position to deal with this issue that NISA should deal with. But from your perspective or from DMV perspective, is it the same kind of testing that w some kind of driving test or com competence test that we give to a car would not be able to alleviate the concern that the public has on the safety? And I will push it a little bit further. Um, autonomous vehicle is another thing, new thing that come along, but but the, the so-called automotive industry existing in this country for more than 100, 100 years. And, and what is it in this so-called new technology that you or DMV perceive that if you do something extra that is practical or is realistic that you would think that the system will work better than guarantee the safety of the public? Uh, I'm not trying to be critical. I'm trying to understand from your perspective what, whether it's really realistic and practical to try to implement something that has not been done for decades in this country. And you've stated in that <laughs> couple of minute time the problem that is dealing with Vehicle Code Section 38750 um, because that section requires us um, to come up with an application that a manufacturer would submit to us and on that application they would make assurances, certain certifications. Um, the vehicle meets federal motor vehicle safety standards, the vehicle doesn't make an operative federal motor vehicle safety standards, the vehicle has an alert for the driver that the autonomous system is engaged or disengaged, um, there's a capacity for an operator to take control, um, whether by operating the brakes and the gas pedal or some other mech or, or, or an emergency stop type of a mechanism. If there's a failure of the autonomous technology, um, and so it's those kind of things. And, and the issue that the DMV has been tangling with for, for quite a while when we, when we speak of the deployment regulations is, is that just as simple as it's a form with some boxes on it that says, I meet federal motor vehicle safety standards, check. I don't make an operative any federal motor vehicle safety standards, check. Here's a picture of the light on our dashboard that's on when, this, when the technology is activated, check. Um, here we got our little red button that you can press that makes the car pull over at the side of the road without hitting something when the technology is disengaged, check. Is it, do we have a system where that's enough? Or, or what we're struggling with is, should there be something more? I mean, should we delve into, um, as Chris has mentioned, you know, in the development of the technology, we've got, you know, there's a whole functional safety program. And then probably in the development of the technology, not only do you have the functional safety program, but you have the ability to look back at it after you've come up with that program of whether or not there are new things that we need to, to look at, you know, whether we're discovering additional things um, that we need to address to keep the vehicle safe into the future? And should we have a, a, a system that is into the future as our technology is out there that we go in there and we monitor it and we hear from other people things that are coming up and we have the ability to address that? And so what we struggle with in coming up with these regulations is how, how you, you know, what should it be? 
Should it be that we rely on something that's just a simple form that says we have done all of this? And, and what the struggle is that we're trying to address today is, is there something more that we can do? Whether that be a third party that comes in and looks at and says, yes, DMV, they've assured you of all these things. And we've looked at the stuff, their, their, their studies, and we've looked at their testing results. And we can tell you, yes, those are valid assurances that they're giving you. Or is it somebody that's embedded in the company that has been there throughout the development of it? And then they say, yep, everything they're telling you is right, DMV, because I've watched the development of this technology and it is safe. Or is it something, um, you know, and even something even different, the, the, the model that we talked about earlier today where the cars are brought into DMV and we somehow run it through its paces and say, okay, it, it meets what we have for a minimal satisfies us that it does what it says it can do and it has these things I, I don't know that and that's kind of like the purpose of today and you can understand as I throw out all of those scenarios those are all the things that we have to address in trying to come up with this is the right regulation this is what we need to put out for the 45 day notice and receive the comments this is what we need to suggest so that we'll have the regulation in effect I, you know, I don't know. I, I keep hearing different dates about when we might see the first um, a, autonomous vehicles. I tried to hold out. My car just broke down on me, and I had to, <laughs> I had to replace it. But um, you know, do we? How are? You know, our our struggle is having something in time, um, and and coming up with that regulation. So you can see, I, I I'm struggling with this here, because our team is we're we're struggling to put it down on paper. Um, and so all of these are valid discussions and, and really what this session is about is about pulling from you guys ideas. I mean, that, that's really the, the, the best product that we can leave from here today is to hear your ideas. I don't want your, your work product. I don't want your trade secrets, but I want some ideas um, that, that I, can, I can use. Maybe not all ideas work and maybe it's a piece of an idea that you come up with or with someone over here on the other side of the room. But we're trying to figure out how do we do this in the best way that, and, and maybe at the end of the day, it is just a form that there's some check boxes. But we've done our due diligence to explore whatever's possible that we could be comfortable with the regulations that we come up with. Uh, so with that, I think Steve has a comment. Uh, yeah, uh, Steve Schlatt over from University of California PATH program. Um, we've been talking here in the context of major auto companies or Google, other very large companies that have invested a lot of effort in this. But these regulations are also going to have to apply to Joe's Garage down the street who might decide they want to put an automated vehicle out on the road. And at some point, the regulations have to have some criteria by which the DMV can draw a line and say, okay, these guys are above that threshold. These other guys are below the threshold. They may have checked the same box on the form. But because somebody at Google or somebody at Volkswagen checks the form, it may not mean the same thing as somebody in Joe's garage who just checked that form. So they need a way of being able to draw that line in a fair and unambiguous way that says, okay, these guys have actually done sufficient work to make sure it's safe, and these other guys haven't. And I don't think we've heard anything here yet that gives a good basis for the DMV to help draw that line. Um, and I mean, that's going to be a concern for these regulations to be valid. Right. Um, I know on our outline, um, the next major subject that we had had was compliance with federal motor vehicle safety standards. And, and I've heard a lot of discussion about the applicability of the federal motor vehicle safety standards. Is that something that gives us our comfort level? Um, it, it, in looking, t looking to the federal motor vehicle safety standards, do we, we say, hey, since they have to certify that a vehicle meets federal motor vehicle safety standards and if they're selling it they can't sell it unless it meets federal motor vehicle safety standards and so is that where we take our comfort or uh, I, I don't know and then so i'd like to open that up for some discussion what role do the th do the current federal motor vehicle safety standards uh, play in our reviewing applications and accepting application and accepting the certifications we know um, and we've heard through many channels that um, and, and there was the, the kind of the warning today, hey, remember there's the preemption question out there, um, but we live in a vacuum right now. We don't have the, the federal standards right now. And we in California has a statute that says cars, you know, come up with a regulation that will allow 
the deployment of the vehicles. And so are the federal motor vehicle safety standards something that we can take comfort in? And, and, and that's where I'd like to open up some discussion now. Sorry, I wanted to speak in just the previous issue that you mentioned. And Go right ahead. And my, one of my ideas was to have a two-tiered approach. By the way, it's Abe Burgess again with ACS. Um, try to have a two-tiered approach. The first is the self-assessment where the manufacturers sign off on it. The second is, a, uh, is the actual third-party assessment. A uh, number of discussions were there about third-party assessors, whether they are qualified. There are a number of assessors out there that can do this. Um, there's a standard called the 1725 lab accreditation, which guarantees that certain authorities can do uh, assessments on certain technologies. Uh, software and firmware is something that we're very um, knowledgeable on, especially with dealing with the FDA. There are standards to the gentleman that actually addressed that, that actually talks about it. The U.S. doesn't follow it, but Europe does. They look at uh, testing protocols. They look at the American encryption standards. Is it 128-bit, 246-bit? Uh, um, you know, so there's, there are standards out there. The U.S. just needs to adopt them, or specifically the state of California. Um, you know, two-tiered approach may be a better way to, to alleviate some of the costs, the resources, uh, and to differentiate between Joe's Garage and Google. But, uh, and, and, you know, and uh, the state of California will never, ever catch all the defects that the manufacturers put out, the ignition recall. I used to work for a supplier that actually supplied the Toyota pedal program to Toyota. And we were actually part of the pro problem. And that was something that Toyota never would have caught or, the, or NHTSA would have ever caught because it was very, very, um, it, it, was, it, w it didn't happen all the time. Um, so there's, n there's never going to be a scenario where you know, the, the state will ever, uh, will ever catch every possible scenario out there. Uh, the, the testing protocols need to have distinct call-outs as to you know, was it w if it's crash worthiness or if it's emissions. Um, you know, uh, put some certain mandates in place and look for those. The rest can be uh, relied on self-assessments. Thank you. Um, I'm, I just want to understand, when you said a two-tier approach, approach. Um, Barb had mentioned a two-tier approach, and the separation is, um, for lack of a better term, established manufacturers or manufacturers that are um, currently building uh, vehicles versus um, companies that will retrofit uh, vehicles and those companies not having any contractual agreement. Is that the two-tier approach that you are? No, my two-tier approach was to come up with a self-assessment, which is what the manufacturers actually fill out. And there's got to be a lengthy assessment as to what they've done. You know, it's not just check boxes that they're looking for, exactly what they've done to fulfill those requirements. You know, and so it's not something that Joe's Garage can fill out or uh, somebody, uh, a retrofitter can fill out because they really need to understand the code of how the vehicle operates. Okay. That was my approach. Okay, thank you. With the, I'm gonna keep you standing there for a couple seconds. Yeah, okay. with, with that self-assessment, I often joke that I, if I was good at math, I'd be an architect right now instead of a lawyer. I have no background in drafting something like that. So do you have suggestions about what that lengthy self-assessment should be? And you don't, you don't have to give it to me now, um, but it's one thing that I want everyone to know is that we are more than willing to take written submissions at any point in time you want to give us some suggestions. Um, they are more than welcome. Um, and so if, if after you leave here today, you have some thoughts about what something like that would look like, I would encourage you to, um, to submit something to us sure. in writing. I can give you my, my business card or, you know, we have the, the email address that you can respond to, but anyone can, you know, with suggestions like that, you can uh, feel free to submit those to us. Okay. Thank I you. Certainly, certainly would. Uh, right up here in front, Stephanie. Yep. Uh, hi, my name is Vladimir Landaverde. <clears throat> I'm not with anybody. I just uh, came to check it out. So um, I think when it comes to self-certification, it makes sense from the DMV's perspective. You have to operate within the domain of what you can manage. However, I think if you're giving them a hiatus, maybe in an X amount of year window, you should do third-party certification. You're behind the eight ball now, but that doesn't mean that in five years from now you can't implement that. Um, and I think you need to look at an operating system. Because, <clears throat> you know, let's say, let, let's not pick on Google, they're from California. You know, we want them to succeed. They help with our taxes, right? So <laughs> let, let's, let's pick on a, a manufacturer that's not in the building, maybe not even in the country, right? So, you know, they haven't heard her concerns over there, right, which are important. So with those guys, right, they could get certified now. And do you guys have smartphones? And you certified them when you bought them and you used them? 
and then you got an update, and then they didn't work anymore? So just because you got certified on day one doesn't mean it should be certified. So I think you really think about um, operating systems and how certifications are maintained. What I would advise is um, anytime software updates are sent out, you have to put a regulation in place so that the manufacturer has to certify with the DMV, even if it's just, you know, the engineer signs it and says they're accountable to the DMV. Otherwise, you know, you're going to see things like what happens on Facebook or anywhere else where bugs get out. Right? And the gentleman brought it out that bugs happen. So just you should think about not the manufacturing model, but the operating system that must maintain compliance. Right? And you're a CIO, right? So you understand what that means. And, um, and I don't think you should back away from third party. Just give them a hiatus. <laughs> When we, when we think of um, operating systems and certifications and, and how they're maintained, uh, it begs the question for how long. You know, for example, um, um, I'm, I'm constantly getting updates on my iPhone that, that I got iOS 6, 7, 8, 8.1, 8.2, you know, whatever. H how long do we hold the manufacturers to, you know, when I, when I joked about my car breaking down, I drove it for 15 years. Um, so if you sell me a car today, are you on the hook for, for that, that certification for the 15 years that I drive it? Is that some point that it ages off or, you know, how should we be concerned about that? As long as they deploy an update, right? Okay. You know, if, if they want to send an update, that means there is a commercial reason for them to do so, mm -hmm. right? They're trying to mitigate risk. So if they want to do it 50 years from now, go ahead and do it, right? Doesn't Chevy sell spare parts for a car 50 years old? If there's a monetary incentive for them to do it, they do it. So don't let them do updates without some type of ongoing accountability. Thank you. Um, y I had introduced the, the, the concept of, of you know, whether or not we should take comfort in, in the, the compliance with federal motor vehicle safety standards. And um, you know, one of the items on our, on our agenda is manufacturer testing for compliance with FMVSS, and I know that, you, you know, the feds don't necessarily require you to, to uh, um, submit test results on anything. You do the testing, and then you um, uh, certify for yourself that the vehicle uh, meets those safety standards. Should we, in our regulations, take comfort in just the representation that you have met and you have tested to meet federal motor vehicle safety standards? I'd like to open it up for a discussion on that. I see, I see Barbara. Yeah, just quickly to mention, in case there are people who are less familiar with FMVSS compliance. So yes, it is self-certification. Every vehicle has a certification label that says this vehicle meets all FMVSS on, in effect on the date of manufacture, that date stamped on the vehicle. It's not merely a, I raise my hand, because there are federal test procedures that the, the government publishes for the third party test houses that actually verify that compliance. So vehicle manufacturers, in practice, do those compliance tests before they ever launch the vehicle to make sure not only that they will pass them, but they will pass them with a sufficient safety margin so that any variations in production, et cetera, would be covered. So it's, it's a, again, for established manufacturers, these are very real, very serious requirements that we take very seriously, but they're a floor, right? We go way beyond the minimum safety requirements, and that's where you get into the internal standards and the external standards and the functional safety and everything else. Go ahead. Rosemary Shahan, President of Consumers for Auto Reliability and Safety. And there are a couple um, problems with relying solely on certification with federal motor vehicle safety standards. And one is that very often um, there aren't standards for everything that can go wrong with the car that you'd really want to be concerned about. And that's with the existing technology that's out there. Under the current safety recall system, there are two prongs that can trigger a safety recall. One is failure to comply with a federal motor vehicle safety standard, which is usually pretty cut and dried. And then there's an unreasonable risk to safety. Most safety recalls fall under the latter category, where there is no federal motor vehicle safety standard that's in effect, but like the axle breaks, the car catches on fire, the wheel falls off, the airbags explode. Um, even though, you know, they deployed when they were supposed to, um, 
So they may comply with standard 208, but there are other problems um, associated with that technology. So that's with the existing technology. So that's, that's one problem, that federal motor vehicle safety standards don't cover everything that really needs to be covered with existing technology for the cars to be safe. And the other problem is that the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, as you know and others have alluded to um, today, hasn't issued regs regarding autonomous vehicles. So you have this whole other layer of um, technology that we're depending on um, where it's up to you all. Um, well, there is no federal motor vehicle safety standard for a lot of the things that they're anticipating. And, and see, that's a very difficult position for me to be in, that, that it's up to you all. Um, because, um, um, and I understand that there aren't federal motor vehicle safety standards for everything. But if I can't take comfort in that, then, then what my task becomes is coming up with something else. So, um, and that's part of what the purpose is here today. So if you believe that I can't take comfort in the federal motor vehicle safety standards, then I would, that would beg the question, how do I come up with something else? And so what's your, do you have a suggestion on how I come up with something else? Yes, I, w I would suggest um, requiring that they build into the, the technology that they're developing error codes like we have with um, emission systems where they report when there's a problem um, and that they provide access to the DMV regarding error codes periodically in the cars that are being tested so that um, the DMV has access directly to that information. Um, how, how do I protect that information? <laughs> and, and, and see, we live in a world where um, anything that, that gets submitted to us for the purpose of, of, of conducting the, the, the state's business is by definition a public record. And so if I tell you, if I tell manufacturer, give me your, your error codes, um, how do I protect it? Is it possible to have, um, well, why shouldn't the public know, right? These are vehicles that are being operated on the public highways. Well, I, I, I guess not? my concern would be uh, that um, that geeky kid sitting in his grandmother's basement right now trying to figure out how to hack an autonomous car if he had access to the error codes, he might be able to do something nefarious. You have a complicated job. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, and I, I understand, you know, I'm, I'm much better at defining the problem than what you need as solutions. Um, right. Thank and, you. Yeah. And the, the other thing I would just say about um, federal motor vehicle safety standards, manufacturers do certify that they meet them, and then sometimes they find out later that they don't. Um, so, you know, there's more to that, and then we get back to the problems with the safety recall system. And your question about how long they should certify, you know, currently they certify that the vehicle met the standards on the, as the um, speaker before me said, they meet the standards on the date of manufacture. Um, and cars are on the road longer and longer. Here in California, because of our wonderful climate, they tend to stay on the road even longer than in many other states. I think the average nationwide is 11.4 years. Um, that's the average age of the car currently being operated on the road. A lot of them are going to last longer than that. So we have to think down the road, you know, will these cars continue to be safe as they get passed on? Thank you. Oh, go right ahead. I'm sorry. <coughs> Mike Carpenter from General Motors. Um, going back to the statement, though, that there are no current FMVSS regulations that apply to uh, autonomous driving vehicles, that's really no different than any of the other new technology developments that are applied to safety technologies. We've got electronic stability control, rear cameras, even seat belts. When they first come out, manufacturers put them into production before there's ever any regulation applying to them. That doesn't mean we're off the hook to make sure that they're not safe. We've still got the, uh, the liability, consumer liability to deal with, and we also still have the, um, the possibility of recall if there's an issue with the system that 
that shows that there's uh, an issue with it or a fault with the system. So I don't think the, the lack of an FMVSS regulation should be a major concern here because we still do have hurdles that we have to overcome with any new technology development, whether it's safety or anything else related to the vehicle. So I think that should be, uh, I guess, one thing to keep in mind as you're going through these debates. Don't get too hung up on the fact that there are not FMVSS regulations in play right now. We've still got some checks and balances that take care of part of that. Well, now that you're up, I'm going to put you on the spot. Sure. because. That's what we were trying to get to at the very beginning of the discussion. At some point, when, when you come up with some new technology, say it's a new seat belt, a new airbag, a new braking system, at some point, you've, you've developed that over years, and at some point you get to that decision, it's ready to roll. I'm ready to put it out into vehicles and, and introduce it to the public. And what we were trying to understand is, can we leech on to that? How do you know, how do you satisfy yourself it's ready to go? Um, because we as DM, we, we don't build cars. Right. And so we don't know where that point should be. And so, and, and my point earlier was you as a manufacturer know when you feel comfortable that it's ready to go. Can we, without getting into your, your trade secrets, without getting into all that kind of stuff, can we borrow from something like that? Can we know, you know, just, just on an outline level, hey, this is what I need to know before I, I put some new innovation in my vehicle and I know it's safe to put out there to the public. Well, again, it's really no different than any other technology that we deal with. That we don't have that oversight for a new technology that we develop today. So, um, but that doesn't protect us from the other checks that we need to deal with. What we do internally is really depending on what problem we're trying to solve and what our own internal requirements are for that system. So it, it really varies on, on what level of technology we're talking about, what system we're really referring to. And there's been a number of other comments that have been made uh, throughout the day about the, the V process. I think a lot of manufacturers end up using something very similar or very related to that. Um, we've all got the iterative process that we work through to make sure that the systems do what we design them to do and what function we're trying to, and what problem we're trying to solve with them. And then there's also the system safety functionality that goes through. And we all use a lot of those tools, even though there's not any one that's been adopted, primarily because each one of those tools has a benefit and an issue associated with it. So it's a combination of those tools that are used as we're going through any of this development work. And it really depends on what technology we're trying to solve. And, and well, I'm wondering, is there some, some uh, generic set of tools that we should be looking to? Because I, I, I keep coming back to the same problem. I know and, and, and I hear and I, and I truly believe, because I buy cars, that it's not your goal to put out something that's unsafe. And so, and so I would have an understanding that at some point, the, no matter what you're developing, you get to a point that says, this car's ready to be out there. And I'm trying to, and, and so there's something, whether you go to a board of directors or you have an engineering review committee, there's somebody that you say to yourselves internally and you go to them and you say, okay, now this is ready to go because it, we are satisfied of A, D, and C. Is there something like that that we can use as we try to develop this regulatory process? Because again, I believe you that you're, you're, you're not in a desire to submit something that is unsafe on the roads. So obviously you have come to some, point, some point internally where you're satisfied of that, right? And so can I borrow from that? Not maybe verbatim, I know that each manufactures differently but maybe there's some common core of things that manufacturers look at to satisfy themselves of that. And can we somehow incorporate that into a, 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 a set of regulations that will satisfy us? Well, I think part of what you're referring to is, is what level of verification <coughs> is going to make you feel comfortable that we've done our due diligence. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can answer that because it, th there's a, a very wide variety of comments that have been made today about how much trust you have in the industry as a whole. And you've really got to determine for yourself, again, that you've got a tough job here, uh, to determine what level of confidence you have that we've done that, that due diligence. There are other activities through SAE, through ISO, through uh, Crash Avoidance Metrics Partnership. Uh, it was a collaborative research work that's done in, in uh, cooperation with NHTSA, for example. Those types of activities are also looking at more of an industry uh, uh, approach as a whole, not just each in, uh, individual manufacturer. Some of those might uh, activities might be a better place to look, um, you know, for some guidance in some of those areas. Thank you. All right. So, um, back 
Uh, Dan Reuter, Electric Movement. Um, I don't think anybody in this room is expecting that these vehicles are going to be 100% perfect in every scenario and there's never going to be a failure just as there isn't in the current system. Um, so, so maybe the solution, I mean, you're looking for verification that bugs don't exist and, and the systems are going to fail only in certain extreme circumstances but not in certain normal circumstances, so where do you draw the line? Um, it's, it's, it's an unsolvable problem, I think. So maybe the solution, maybe the, 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 the practical application is uh, let the manufacturers put vehicles on the road in, in, in use cases that they've certified to be operational and publish the safety records. And you're requiring a certain number of accidents per million miles driven and that is a better standard than a current average safe driver in California. So there at least is some sort of verifiable improvement over the status quo that justifies the existence of the program. And it would be something that would be publicly verifiable, isn't trade secret. Maybe in certain cases of failures, maybe the manufacturers wouldn't be too happy that the, the results got out there. But uh, I think in general, the people in this room are fairly forthcoming about what they're, the, well, the fact that they have, have not had significant failures. Um, so I don't know, that might be a solution. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, uh, Jonathan Handel. On, on, the, on the subject of error codes, uh, going back to that for a second, um, which really is a part, part and parcel of the ongoing monitoring of safety as the, when the products have been deployed, um, a, you know, a, a raw error code in the case of a sophisticated software system isn't really going to mean anything without, without access to the source code and without understanding you know, what module failed and what, set of, what were the variable values and what set of interactions happened and all that sort of thing. And so that really gets back to the issue that even if DMV were given that, that material, it, wouldn't, it would probably not have the expertise to, to do anything with it and you have the, the IP issue, that gets back to the issue or to the solution of third-party verification. That the, the detail on a failure, the error code, which really is gonna be much more than just you know, a two-digit code or something, uh, goes to a third party, to the third-party certifying entity uh, that is not subject to uh, freedom of information and public disclosure rules when it comes to trade secrets and is able to digest that material and make some sense of it and report it publicly and to the DMV in a way that, you know, that doesn't compromise trade secrets, but that does say, you know, hey, we, we're detecting problems when there are, you know, when there's mud flying at the sensors at the same time as the car's making a turn or, you know, whatever the, the analysis might be. Because it really is important that the ongoing uh, operation of these vehicles provide feedback and, and be designed, and that the regs be designed in a way that what we learn from the actual use of these vehicles uh, increases safety. And th the larger context here, of course, is these are the first robots that anyone, other than a little Roomba, that, you know, that anyone is going to encounter. And they are potentially very dangerous objects. Also, what DMV does is going to set a template, not, not just for other DMVs and to some extent NHTSA, but it's going to set a pattern for the regulation of robotics generally because this is the first robot that, you know, and this, these are robots. They're computer-controlled machines that can roam about the environment autonomously. Uh, Google owns a half dozen other robotics companies, and we're going to hear the same thing in other contexts when they deploy it, when they introduce robots to, you know, take care of the elderly or whatever it might be. Just let us certify, trust us, you know, yes, they're going to be picking up people and setting them down on beds, but they'll be safer than the way it's done today. So you have a lot on your shoulders, clearly, but that is part of the context. Ron. Ron? It's on the bottom, Ron. Uh, hi, Ron Medford from Google. Um, I just wanted to say at a high level, there are kind of like two things that, that, that companies do like ours to make sure the product's safe. One is to do the analysis that we talked about, this functional safety analysis, which Brian mentioned, uh, what the major components are into, you know, for, for the DMV, it seems to me that kind of a reasonable and practical step would be to ensure um, that a company's 
uh, assure you that they have taken these diligent steps. And I think that is kind of as much as can be reasonably uh, expected from, um, from the DMV in terms of what their capabilities are for review, even a third party in a reasonable period of time to take a very complex system. You know, dr software is driving a lot of systems and vehicles today, which are pr pretty much un completely unregulated. Um, and it doesn't mean that there, there won't be a defect at time uh, at some point, but uh, those actually do get detected and, uh, and get dealt with. But and the second thing is actually the testing that gets done. So the second component is you're testing the technology for uh, safe performance. And you're developing it and here, you know, companies are doing on the, on the roads, on public roads here in California. And that testing um, information about how well you've done and a part of the equation to decide that you're ready for public road operation and then the third thing that's been suggested today is something the DMV has expertise in. It doesn't mean that um, in every case that because you've done an analysis, because you've done the testing, and because we do this public road testing that the DMV is putting a stamp of approval on the technology, that it's absolutely safe and nothing can be happened. But it seems to us that it's a kind of a reasonable step and a practical step of this kind of multi-pronged uh, multi, uh, uh, approach of trying to um, get some assurance that the product is ready, ready for operation, and I think that makes sense. And then on back to the issue, you, you talked about the uh, motor vehicle safety standard self-certification process and what role the DMV perhaps should play in that. And I think that this is an area that's pretty well covered by NHTSA. Um, nearly all vehicles um, that are self-certified are tested for compliance with those standards by by NHTSA, and uh, and so they're you know this year's model just carries over to next year's model and the things that change in those models generally don't change compliance with those standards. So I think that there's reasonable assurance already that, um, that those are in compliance. And then the make an operative provision would be a very difficult piece. Remember trying to establish compliance if the DMV wanted to do that is a huge major undertaking um, that the government is already for the most part already doing. So I don't, I don't think that y that part you need to worry about quite so much quite honestly. Um, so I would suggest that uh, what's happening already in America with respect to make an operative or with compliance is being dealt with pretty rarely. Th is there a non-compliance? Uh, Rosemary mentioned that already to the standards. So I don't think that's an area that, uh, that you have to worry about it so much. When you mention the, um, the, the testing data, the testing information, I know we're under a regime that we have um, the testing regulations in effect. What should we be seeking information about what's happening in the testing um, in our our approval of the deployment process and and what role will will actually getting some input from the manufacturers about what's going on in testing should it play a role in the approval process for an application for the deployment so the testing the testing regs have a little bit of information in there now about disengages generally and about uh, crashes that have to be reported to, to the DMV um, I think that we, if we get to this section, which we haven't gotten to yet on the right. agenda that about is that, that, that yeah. I, think we, I think we have something to say about that, and Chris has some ideas about that, so I think we would like to reserve that discussion, sure. and, or unless Chris wants to talk about it now, but sure. yep. yep. <laughs> <laughs> so again, the, the, the issue that we're discussing right now is whether we can take some satisfaction in, in the um, the assurance that that a vehicle is compliant with federal motor vehicle safety standards and and again what I was trying to kind of prompt out is at some point manufacturers satisfy themselves that the vehicles are compliant with federal motor vehicle safety standards and that we would be able to look to that I, and and then we've heard a lot of discussion about using a, a third party to get some comfort level with a third party We've also heard some discussion about what the problems are about, you know, trying to introduce a third party into a process that that goes on over years. Um, I, I still have some concerns about does that work for us if the if, you know, now that we're coming in um, later in the game and saying you needed to have somebody throughout, you know, the time that you were developing this to assure us that what you're doing is safe and so I think it, it it does take us into that realm of looking at you know what role does test data have in in giving us those assurances and what is the level of test data that we should be looking to or any level of test data at all um, when we're when we're uh, approving an application for deployment I mean we have 
minimal test data requirements that are in the in the testing regulations thing uh, um, you know like when did the vehicle have to um, deactivate the autonomous technology because there was a you know there was a safety related reason that was unplanned or unexpected but is that enough does that does that give us enough when we look at the application that we're going to allow the vehicles to deploy onto the streets so I would like to to move into and start discussing, you know, at least that aspect. Um, and, and again, to summarize it, what role will, will us actually receiving test, test data have in giving us those assurances that the, that the certifications for safety have been met? I don't know, Chris, if you want to address that now, I'm putting you on the spot, but, but it's Ron's fault because he said you wanted to talk about that. So I'd get him on the ride back. I, yeah, <laughs> no, definitely, absolutely. So Chris Armson with Google. Uh, so yeah, so we've kind of been on record that we think that the, the information that's being reported right now uh, under the test regulations is not <coughs> really going to give you a clear picture of, of the readiness of the systems, right? Because when we uh, have our test drivers out on the roads, uh, we give them very clear direction and, and kind of rules of engagement and have them disengage the system preemptively in the interest of safety to avoid you know, situations, uh, putting, the fi uh, putting the vehicle through situations on the road uh, that it may not be ready to encounter yet, right? So, so those measure that really the, the kind of the number of those disengages is actually a measure of our caution I in testing the system, not a measure of the readiness of the system. What we do with that data, though, is, is um, use it to improve the system. And we track both kind of the benign, you know, the, the test driver disengaged the vehicle for whatever reason, and it turns out that it, it wasn't a big deal. And then we also track the rate at which, uh, if the test driver hadn't disengaged the system, that uh, an accident would have occurred. Uh, and that's part of the data that we, um, that we will be using to, to understand how ready our system is. Uh, but you know, the, the, that, that um, what we call kind of a critical uh, incident, you know, the rate of those is, is uh, is very, very low. So it's, you know, we, we catch them well in advance of it actually happening on the roadway. Thank you. Would anyone else like to be heard on that? Uh, I see a hand, uh, Stephanie, right behind you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kyle Vogt from uh, Cruise Automation, and we are uh, a manufacturer of aftermarket technology that provides driver assistance and autonomous vehicle functions. And I think it was raised earlier this year, an issue of, you know, should there be two tracks of testing for people doing retrofits or aftermarket? versus the manufacturers of OEMs who originally developed the cars. And uh, I think the suggestion that, that uh, you know, one be subjected to third party testing sort of falls back into the same category of issues with that kind of testing. Um, whether it's, you know, whether those people have the experience or whether they're involved in the process during the time in which this technology was developed. Um, and so that, that creates a dilemma, which is that there are, um, you know, you wanna ensure that, I think the term was used before, Joe's Garage isn't putting products out on the road. Yet on the other hand, if we said five years ago we were having the same conversation and Google was sitting in the room, a search company, you know, what do they know about building cars, right? And had we not created this testing permit process and let them prove that they have the ability to build good and safe technology, uh, they wouldn't have been able to advance the art such that they have. And so I, I would encourage uh, you to think about um, ways to avoid regulations that could inadvertently be anti-competitive and stifle innovation. And I think one way to do that is, well, um, uh, companies doing aftermarket or retrofits may not have the, the brand uh, history or trust, and uh, if that's the right word for it, that some of these larger and more established companies have. Um, test data might be a great way to distinguish the Joe's Garage from the uh, company that is being diligent and putting a lot of thought and effort into making sure systems are safe. Uh, and exactly what that test data is, I, I don't have any great suggestions for you right now. Um, I was hoping Chris might be able to enlighten us on that. Um, but I, I was just proposing that as a solution for helping you distinguish between a Joe's Garage and a, a company that's putting the proper amount of due diligence into their products. But you, you would understand why we would have a, you know, additional concerns about someone who took someone else's product that may not have been designed or, or has some, um, somehow you're accessing systems and adding things to it such that you're you're introducing autonomous technology into a, a vehicle that the manufacturer itself didn't build um, and design for that technology that you're introducing you 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 would understand that we would have some additional concerns about what is it that you're doing 
that we, sh we should be concerned about, as well as, I mean, does that raise for us additional concerns about what you're doing somehow making ineffective the, the federal motor vehicle safety standards that the manufacturer's already certified to? Um, because I won't know that, and, and the person that built that car won't know that either. And so that you, as someone aftermarket, adding something to a vehicle, do we now have to make you go through and give us the data to show that everything you did did not undo what the manufacturer did. Yeah, and, and those are very valid concerns. I mean, without going into the specific implementations of our technology, one thing we do is we use the same processes, you know, this view model and functional safety to, to validate how we build our systems and how they interact with the vehicle. And one thing we do that may actually be sort of a unique perspective is we assume every component in the underlying vehicle could and will fail because they do at some point. Um, you know, uh, perhaps an OEM who has been, you know, they, they have, already done the safety analysis and assume there's a very small chance of failure for these indi individual components may not put as much weight on that. But we do because we recognize that it is a modification to a vehicle and that vehicle could fail or some interaction with it might no not work the way it's intended. Um, and so I think the same process applies to developing uh, a, a safe product, whether it is an aftermarket product or, or built into the, uh, the vehicle itself. Um, but I agree your concerns are merited, and my suggestion was to look at test data. <coughs> you know, let's, let's uh, use this testing permit program to collect data and ensure that it is safe before you allow it to be sold to the public. Well, I, I guess the other thing is, and when we talk about allowing to be sold to the public, there's always the, the kind of like the unforeseen consequences, the unintended consequences. Um, you know, and I'm not sure how manufacturers feel about this, but what assurances, once we say something like you've added stuff to the technology of the vehicle, um, there are a lot of things that manufacturers do that, that give people comfort in, in buying the vehicle. For example, they, they issue warranties about how the vehicle is going to perform. And should we be concerned that when we allow you to come in, are, are, are you going to, and I don't, I don't mean you, but I just mean like some, some aftermarket provider, are they going to step in the shoes if a manufacturer then says, wait a minute, I'm no longer warranting that drivetrain for, for the next, you know, 200,000 miles, whatever it is, seven years, 100,000 miles, because these guys have come in and they've tinkered with, you know, the, the, the steering systems of the vehicle. Um, I guess you can see what my concerns are as, as we're dealing with Joe's garage. We've now kicked up what our concern should be in making sure that the consumer that gets the vehicle is getting everything that a manufacturer would have warranted. And, and, and even then, all of the protections that the manufacturer that is assuring the person they still have when they when they come to that third party and they and they do they add something to that vehicle yeah, I, I agree with that <laughs> okay. um, m my point was that you know if we're, if we're focusing on determining if and when this kind of technology is safe for operation on public roads those things are, are you know part of the challenges in ensuring that the liability chain is intact and warranties still apply and that but that that's sort of outside the scope particularly on safety and testing for these these systems <sighs> It could be outside the scope of safety and testing, but once we get to allowing in a regulatory regime that would have something that would allow, say, a third party to do that, that's something that we're going to have to address and make sure. Because, you know, when you think about it, when people enact laws, for example, laws like this one, there is a consumer protection mode to it. And, and the reason why there are certain standards are because there is a consumer protection mode to it. And so wouldn't we as a Department of Motor Vehicles basically saying, hey, now you, you third party that's applying something to someone else's vehicle, should we have at least some comfort level that all the stuff that a manufacturer said I'm going to do for that vehicle, that consumer doesn't lose those protections? Yes, absolutely. Thanks. Thank you. Um, right up here in the front. Again, Vladimir Landaverde. So, um, you know, I guess you're talking about how, you know, the software code and all these autonomous systems, they're going to develop over time. So I, I think, you know, and, and manufacturers want to give themselves leeway, right? So I, I think you should give yourself leeway as a regulator and maybe um, put in more stringent requirements and testing for hazmat, right, hazardous material, um, commercial vehicles, and maybe even limit the number of passengers, right? Um, so, so you know, allow yourself time to uh, maybe put in more stringent regulations, right, for, the, for anybody that, you know, whoever wants to make a lot of money by having a commercial autonomous vehicle, like a bus or a limousine, right, um, if they're going to have the financial incentive, th they're going to go and spend that extra money to get that third-party certification, right? 
um, or wait for the DMV to build up that skill set and partner it with you. You're, you're jumping right. the gun. Actually, okay. the commercial vehicles is autonomous vehicle regs set number three. <laughs> so, so at least with these regulations, we're we're contemplating more of the, the the private passenger auto setting, and we've always recognized that even in our testing regulations, we did not no. you know, we did not address the testing of of the more commercial applications. And it's always been our desire that this isn't, you know, once we get this set complete, this isn't the end of the game, mm -hmm. because then we need to start tackling the, the more commercial aspects uh, of, of autonomous vehicles. Maybe you can and bring that those is, in. that also has the same kind of promises, fuel savings and things like that, yeah. traffic congestion. So. Well, maybe you should think about them more together then, right? And I know it's even more work, right? But, because um, industry will have a benefit if, if you know, if you can accelerate their market opportunity into that segment, there's got to be more resources that can help you build good regulations for things. Thank you. I see it is about 20 minutes to one, and so I'm going to use this opportunity to take another 10-minute um, break, come back at 10 minutes to one, and then we'll just go through to the conclusion of the hearing at, at 2 o'clock. So let's take a 10-minute break and come back at 10 to one. Thank you.